This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. I looked up at the tree, rich with its canopy of fire crimson leaves, and I could see that nature simply couldn't help but give of herself. All she created, she created from the endless joy and out of sheer love of what she was. She could not help but give, never with a thought of how much or to whom. She was the very being of abundance itself. All she gave, she gave out of sheer ecstasy of the divine presence coursing through her veins. And this was why she sang. The time had come for us to join her. No longer would we tell our sad stories, bemoaning our sagas of woe. The time had come for us to drop the discord in our hearts with all its bitter tones of clashing cacophony. We were ready, ready to join in the harmony, the harmony enveloping the rest of the earth. The time had come for humanity to join creation singing its song. We now would sing, too, a song so sweet, so beautiful, coming from the pure joy of being alive, expressing and giving of ourselves in gratitude for life flowing through us as our hearts pounded full and deep in the wonderment of a world filled with plenty. Valeria interviews Kristen Regison. She is the author of The End of Scarcity, The Dawn of the New Abundant World, Kristen Regison is the best-selling author of The End of Scarcity, professional wealth management advisor with over 30 years of experience. She is a certified digital currency expert and earned her master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. She holds certificates in fintech from MIT and in money mechanics from the University of Cumbria, London. Kristen loves the adventure of life. Her journeys through the world include climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, hiking through the Sahara Desert, and studying at a spiritual school in the foothills of southern India. Meet Kristen at kristenregason.com. Here's the interview with Kristen Regison. In your own words, who is Kristen Ruggison? Oh, gosh. Isn't that always sort of hard to pick? You know, um, really, I would say a lover of life and a lover of just the wonder and experience that is seemingly new, or even I would say seemingly not new, but when we look, always new. And um, life is this. It's, It's sort of wanting us to be present, wanting us to be aware, no matter how we can sort of be zombified in our mm-hmm. routines. Yes. And um, I think that my the main space that I identify myself in is someone filled with curiosity and in love with the experience of whatever this all is. <laughs> mm, yes, I love that. <laughs> this idea that we are always open and we can't be always open to everything that shows up, everything, that anything that presents itself as an experience. When did you uncover or discover this love for life? Oh, gosh. You know, I think I definitely was born with it um, and experiencing the full range of emotions and just the power in feeling all the emotions, 
Um, and I was really lucky to grow up in a family that encouraged curiosity, encouraged learning. And um, I just sort of had that joie de vivre. Um, and also, you know, I would say certainly the full emotions of, you know, feeling the anger or the frustration. Even as a little baby, I remember, you know, when, you know, I, I being told no, how it would you know, radiate through the whole body because um, I was really identifying with the expansive um, empowerment of life that that is our inherent nature. Yes. And this is the main topic of, of our conversation, abundance. And that's the title of your book is in the title of your book, The End of Scarcity, The Dawn of the New Abundant World. As I said, off record, I love the title. It caught my attention immediately and resonated true, which that's how I see, how I know something, how I know and I don't know at the same time when something resonates with that, that's, um, let's say, that can bring us that sense of freedom. It's when whatever it is that's been said or presented, it kind of stands in its own. It's almost like it has its own existence, its own, mm. a life of its own. And that's how I know. But at the same time, I can't really explain how I know those things, but mm. that's how it resonates. So I want to thank you again for being open to explore what this is, which we call life. Not all of us are, are ready to do that. And, and that might be the reason why we suffer. Do you see it that way too, Kristen? You know, I, I really, you know, I was even saying the other day, I thought a wonderful book that I might write would be Don't Avoid the Squeeze or, yeah. oh, yeah. Good <laughs> you, know, one. Right? Yes. Or, you know, pain really almost <laughs> needs a new definition. Could we say it as yeah, yeah. a But, you know, that inhale and exhale of life, that contraction and that expansion, and even now how we were talking earlier, how things shift moment to moment. Um, no matter which moment we're in, whatever spectrum on the circle, it seems real. You know, it seems like it's, it's, this is the state. And then all of a sudden we do get a perspective of multiple perspectives that of course, many, many perspectives that are always existing at the same time. But I think that, you know, the interesting thing about the human journey is really being in this tight contraction, which often even we think of in the material world or the money world. And, um, it maybe isn't quite as, as, um, close to our real sense of ourselves in that we, really know, um, especially when we're, we're feeling connected, how powerful we are in the sense that's even beyond us, just the, the effortlessness of life. And yet, um, it's this dance between the inhale and the exhale, the contraction and the expansion, the earthliness and the, um, the beauty of the inspiration of all the knowing that's beyond. Mm, yes. And that's the dance, isn't it? <laughs> that's a, a beautiful dance. I mean, I call it beautiful because in a sense, we can't really, even when we get the, a glimpse or we have this felt understanding that freedom is here, although we're limited by nature. But mm -hmm. at the same time, freedom, it's so obvious that we are free at the same time. And it's not a paradox. I know we you mentioned that word off record, and I, and again, I did mention it again, but it's not a paradox. To me, is as if what's limited, it's also part of the, the limitless. Mm -hmm. So once you are in that, um, which is not a thing, so it's not a space, it's out of time and space, because you know, nature is within time and space, but those limitations. So it's everything is in the limitless. So it becomes so much more clear and light, everything, <laughs> everything mm -hmm. that seems to be heavy and stressful or ugly or whatever it is. And then, and I guess that's why I use the word beautiful, because once we are there in this limitless abundant space or spaceless space, then beauty arises. Um, Absolutely. And in all the different places that we often don't expect as well, you know, even symbolic how the lotus grows from the mud. Um, but really it is that rawness, that realness that is even more beautiful, <laughs> you know, because it's really, we, you know, we connect with it, we know, and, um, and it has sort of that unspeakable wisdom in it. Um, that's sort yeah. of beyond mind. And it's almost a contrast, the contrast between the mud and the flower. It makes it even more beautiful, the flower, mm -hmm. in a way. 
Wow, so do I. Yeah, you made me think about that now. Visualize the, the lotus flower. Um, you know, that even um, is, is part of the reason what inspired the book, The End of Scarcity, in that I was really seeing that the material and the spiritual are one, and that money itself, for us to go to the next level, or even just in the worldliness of the belief in not enoughness, the belief in scarcity, no matter how real it becomes, to get to this next level, which we know exists, we have to bring the two worlds together. And, um, you know, whether it's, it's looking at a tree as being a tree or an entire complex, um, a universe of insects and all the interconnectivity mm -hmm. of what's, you know, when we would microscope into it, uh, this is the same thing in our money world that, um, especially for those of us who tend to be really connected to the more, um, you know, which can be really called the more beautiful ideas, but mm. these wonderful feelings, the money itself, um, you know, sort of in binding that energy in rooting things to the earth is also extraordinarily beautiful because it, it provides a vehicle in many ways for all of these other expressions to come through. Mm. And um, it's even trans it's even coming more to transform into something else. But um, the, it's it's you know I, I think this this conflict or this compartmentalization that many, many humans live with is what now is up for readdressing and healing in our lives mm -hmm. so that the empowerment can flow from inspiration through the mundane and through our doingness and then back up and support the inspiration like a beautiful cycle. Mm -hmm. As I listen to you, um, the images, I, I'm very visual. It's nature. You speak very much from a place of um, cycles, of transformation, that renewal, transformation, even in the sense of understanding, grasping, understanding what money is. And that very much kind of resonates as uh, nature or life, or what we call life is. So talk to me, since we already started talking about the book, I had other questions here, but the first chapter, it's titled, There is No Such a Thing as Money. Yeah. Talk to, that made me smile. So talk to me for a moment about that, that yeah, idea. You know, this is really true. This is where the path to freedom begins mm. um, in this integrated perspective. Because, you know, I say that when we find ourselves on this earth and we look at the big people around us and the sun and the moon and gravity and money, we just accept all of it as the life that we're living in. And um, very few things are questioned in terms of, okay, these are the people around us. Mm -hmm. This is yes. the sun. This is what it seems to do. And here's money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And our relationship with money usually is as simple as, okay, it exists out there. I need to get some. And once I do, here are the things that I'm going to do with it. And, um, and yet, it really is the most impactful thing in our society. Um, it dictates so many things behind the scenes and often is the source of great conflicts, um, limiting lives, limiting relationships, defining relationships, defining self-esteem. And often for many, many people, it's more important than their health or obviously health will come second to this pursuit. So what is this mysterious, powerful thing? And, and could we actually come home to the idea that it's not a thing at all? And um, so that on two levels, I mean, um, the most important aspect is that money itself when we created it, so it's not a law of nature like everything else around us, um, but it's, it's something that together as humans, we decided was a good idea. And many people may have mixed feelings and say, oh, I don't like it. I've had a terrible relationship with it. Or, you know, I was, I was taught to think it was, it was bad. And others may have the opposite experience. But regardless, if we strip all of that away and look at it just with very innocent new eyes and say, oh, gosh, it's an agreement that in society or in history at some point, humans came together and said it's better to live together, even if at times we we get annoyed with one another. It's still better to live together 
And you know what? We're going to still develop this technology, this thing to assist us, to help us exchange with one another. And so money more or less was created to be an equal sign in an equation. If um, if you have three plus four and I have stored seven somewhere from contributing three plus four to someone before, and now we match and I'm what would like to have your three plus four, we exchange with the seven. And the money actually helps us evaluate as a technology, do I feel comfortable with the exchange? Because there can be no buyer without the seller. There can be no giver without the receiver. And so it's that beautiful same infinity in life, that mirror of the relationship, because life is nothing. We we have actually no thoughts that are not in relation to the other. And there's actually, there's no experience in this life without everything being a relationship from the most seemingly, um, you know, transient from saying hello to a stranger in the street or interacting with a store clerk to the most intimate of parents or spouses or children and so on. And yet, so money itself actually assists in our relationships. So the question is, um, you know, why does it seem to distort things? And um, we've gotten sort of off the beaten track. And when we looked at different civilizations that were thriving or having Renaissance or golden age periods, they articulated and designed money in a different way than we do today. And they were very much rooted in the truth that knowing the only thing that gave money its value was the abundance of the beautiful gifts and passions and inspirations that humans were born with. You know, and this, if if we even were to just view humanity and see kind of humanity connected to the abundant nature or field that's energetically around us, where we're drawn to the beauty of this that's unique for each person, or every baby that comes brings more wealth to whichever community it's born in because it comes with divine inspired gifts that, you know, hopefully she or he can express. And so it's this that's actually inseparable from our being. And we can, st- we, life can become difficult. We can easily get depressed and, and feel distance from our gifts and our passions, but they're always whispering to us. And when we tune into them, um, the, however they are, this is the inseparable part of wealth because wealth is what we contribute to one another. And you see, money is totally dependent on our contributions. And yet in this world, we're living the opposite way. And so life is calling to us to say, oh, the little chick is maturing in the egg and it's time to pack out of this, you know, what seemingly what kept it safe, but really just kept it until it was time for the next level to be born. And as humanity, we're, we're coming very close to this precipice. I do think um, our money systems will be really redefined. We may have different currencies in the next year, all these different things coming. So it's very important that people get in tuned with these ideas. And all of our ancestors are sitting at the edge of their seats praying that we get this breakthrough because it is the spiritual awakening of us coming home to say, wait a minute, humanity in its inordinate ability and capabilities and imagination and creativity and expressions and the flow of resources has the opportunity to build a world that we wish. And and in fact, it's very difficult to stop people from gravitating toward their passions. So money itself is, it wa- is meant to be the expression of that. And um, so today we are living a lot of in the illusion of scarcity, which does seem quite real for all people in certain moments and some people quite a bit of time. Um, But it, it is because we actually have misdesigned the dollar 
And we are also going to have the chance in our communities, alternative commun- uh, uh, currencies that will grow, as well as other currencies that are coming to redesign money that's going to represent that wealth that we create. Mm, wow. Wow. It's re- re- it's it's really an extraordinary time. Um, even though it takes, you know, there, it's it's almost like sitting with some of these concepts and letting them speak to you over time because they're right. in all of us. Even all of this knowledge is here. It just needs to be awakened. Mm. Yes, it's within us. Wow, I tried to make some notes here. <laughs> you said <laughs> so much that um, resonated. Um, the Giving, receiving, that, um, that's so true, Kristen. I have interviewed somebody who brought this to my attention, that this is what the definition of love is, oh. giving and receiving. Giving and receiving. And, and for many people, it's much more difficult to receive. Um, you know, what I do think, because we have fallen into a world where we believe money is separate and outside of us, mm-hmm. yeah. and um, yet we are sort of in the structural way where we're actually using consumer debt or mortgage debt as our money. And um, even in some of the events we've seen with potential banking crises and deposits, and we really, truly, as a culture, do not understand the mechanics of money. And that's really, in the first few chapters, I encourage include it in, in sort of the, the dialogue and the story so that it can aid in the teaching of it. A um, hundred years ago, they knew this information. It's just been worked out of the textbooks. It's no longer in the schools. Um, I learned many of these ideas as a little child, but still I had to go and relearn them through seven years of study. <laughs> and um, so we're, we actually, we have the world turned upside down where we're dependent on people borrowing debt at a, at a bank, typically through a mortgage or a school tuition, which is what has been driving the prices higher because the debts are available for prices to go higher and higher. And it never used to be that way. And um, so we are living in a way that we have to capture what we believe is a thing, but it's really just someone's debt And um, in order to access all of our talents and our gifts and resources, when instead we were supposed to access our gifts and resources first and and issue money off of that. So I, I do include in the later chapters the you know the, the path and the blueprint of how communities will begin to do this, even though I think corporations and even states will do this because this is what's even been done in the history of the United States. Um, but the way to really break open is still in the spiritual principles and to 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 begin to find that resonance in ourselves and the, the rejection of the idea or the dislocations of those ideas and sit with them to feel the wealth that is inside of us and also to feel the passions of what we want to express and, and the things we want to be part of um, because it will return the idea that both parties are needed. And, you know, when we sort of are on this contorted view of money, this perversion of this beautiful concept, um, we come to think that if we have dollars or we have money in our hand, we we are more valuable than, than the other one with the products that we want to exchange. And this is, this is sort of a violation of spiritual law. Um, you know, it's equal and money is just the equal sign. It's, and when we redesign these currencies, which are happening already, um, money's going to go in the back seat and people's desire to contribute and express one another will be in the driver's seat. Because this is even what money was wanted all along. It wanted to be created to serve humanity, not humanity to serve whatever we're using as money. Ah, yes. And it sounds like for that to happen, it's the movement from fear to love, isn't it? Oh, it it really is. You know, and it's so close. It's just a small shift on the dial. And yet when we're in fear and we're in this survivor energy, which of course has been in the human ancestry on this planet for so long. So, you know, it's so understandable that we can oscillate all throughout the day. And um, when that survival energy is triggered, it's very hard to even imagine just shifting the perspective, the small amount 
And then when we do, we're usually so lit up, we can't even again then feel the, mm-hmm. the hungry survivor, you know? That's true. Yes. Um, but, yeah. um, it is, it's, it's, and I even say it's the love, the, lo- the, the love that sort of is, you know, ha- it has no opposite because it is life and it, and, and we know that this is the principle of a life is abundance because you can't put that out. You can't stop thinking of new ideas. They right. come to you, right. yes. <laughs> you know, and even new yeah. beauties and new <laughs> adventures and we grow. And so we, we are swimming in the midst of abundance like a kaleidoscope. And, um, and so money is a technology that must be designed correctly to be in service to that. And, and truly, um, if we were to look at the beautiful periods on this earth, they used a different form of money. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's really curious, actually. <laughs> Very much, especially the way you explain all this, because I never heard this way before. Although everything goes back to that limitless, infinite reality. That's what it sounds like every time I hear you and in so many, I mean, so many amazing people that I have here. They, I mean, it's always the end message, the, the final message. That's what it is. Returning to that limitless, infinite reality, which is the ground for the, the limited one, the transactional mm. reality. Right. And, and really, um, we're going to up-level all of our interactions. So even if they're brief and even if they are just that one interaction that we had with, with all the different souls that we're interacting with, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, it, it will lose that, that transactional sort of quality. Um, you know, I, I have um, sort of you know, those experiences that they're, they're simple, but you remember them in your, in your life. And I had one once when I was in college and then I can remember, you know, sometime, some years ago, rushing around at work and both experiences where I was sort of, you know, um, busy, short tempered in my own way of why standing in line, wanting to either get my coffee or my next thing and get off to the, you know, to get done the next thing on the list. And in that wanting and getting, I would have an opportunity where my life would pass before me and I would see all the getting and all the doing and all the getting and all the doing. And I would think to myself, Kristen, what are, what is it all about? Is it so that you can get your things, eat, you know, drink your coffee, eat your food, buy your thing, and then what sit and go home and sit on the couch. And is this, you know, and, and so this is what happens when we, when we do, when we separate money from our gifts of service when we when we separate our jobs from our passions or even our interactions someone even who who doesn't really like their job but when it loses the 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 ex, the vehicle to express themselves and connect in relationship then we've we really have sort of commodified turned our lives into this um consumption commodity and we have bastardized money at that point and we and and we lose the whole root of the experience which is that duality the inspired materiality and um you know we, i really do think we're the first generation whose consciousness level is high enough and there's going to be enough enough of a collective to really up level and hold it that we will be able to not only change these money systems to how they have been changed, but be able to put them in a form that they cannot be tampered with. Um, and, you know, even the, the people that came to start this country, they were all in debt in England and they, they visioned a more beautiful life. Um, it wasn't even that they came here for religious freedom. They really came here for financial freedom and they knew they actually created the money properly at the beginning. Their little, their colonial script or their paper money represented a certain amount of productivity from farms or from land banks. And it wasn't, they, they still, we were not able to hold it at that level of consciousness. And when the more hierarchical structures that were still needed, like the monarchy said, oh, no, no, what is that mischief that those 
people there in the colonies are doing. This is too much freedom. You know, people are going to thrive because as much money could circulate and it would be legitimate because it would be backed by the real productivity that the people were creating. And they didn't have too much circulating and they didn't have too little. And when humanity would use gold coins, it still could easily fall into this old perversion of um, greed, which comes from lack. Greed comes from the belief in the illusion of scarcity and from that hungry survivor, rather from that connected, unique expression. And so the um, this this beautiful money they created was the reason the Revolutionary War started, because it was soon outlawed, and they were forced to go back to gold coins, which someone with with enough domination could make them scarce on purpose. And so, though you know um, we were able to break through, we were really only able to break through until the early 1800s. And then we went back to these systems. So this story is sort of the backstory or the backbone of all history. It repeats over and over. And even many of the same underlying issues that we're experiencing today, whether it's the political fracturing or corruption that we see, the fracturing all about us in ourselves, even in our families, social issues and confusion and monetary issues, you know, what is the right policy? These are just symptoms of not understanding money correctly, that it actually is meant to be beautifully connected to what we create and that it's here to serve humanity. And then it must be designed correctly by the blueprint, which, you know, is in the book, but also has been known for eons. And he, and it is our pathway of breaking free. And um, I do think that we sort of with technology that's coming and it, it always follows the, the scope, you know, can be used for bad, you right. know, sort of lesser things. Yes. And also with yes. enough intention can really be used to be at service. Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is this beautiful healing in many ways uh, where we're coming to say, my goodness, if we all really did live in the spaciousness of the wonder that we are wanted, that every single person is wanted and needed as part of this kaleidoscope. Um, and that whatever you want is, is, that is wanted from you. The desire is coming from beyond both parties. And when we begin to take the seat again, we're even going to recreate our material institutions in a way that will reflect this. I absolutely love the way you express this knowledge because I had no idea about the origin of money or the intention, all this. And, and the way you speak of money being this part of um, representing, reflecting our inner reality. So mm -hmm. that just so much, I mean, that's the truth. There's nothing really happening outside of us. Everything's within us. Within us. And it also offers this opportunity to really redefine a relationship with money. Um, you know, even in the sense of really respecting its energy because it is one's divine gifts. You know, um, our life force was given and contributed and, and it was, and money was received as a receipt. And so it's very precious in many ways and it needs to be freed of the contortions. And when we're receiving money from someone else, we're also receiving the life force of their creations how they get, they contributed mm. them to someone else, right. you know, yeah. and, and, and yeah. it's, it's, it's sort of been bound and anchored so that it can be experienced in this three slash 4d reality. And, um, uh, and then I think it really has an opportunity to be up leveled, um, and appreciated and then also valued in terms of saying, my goodness, we're stewards of it. And we're also stewards of how it's designed. Um, because for a long time, part of that unfueled survivor energy, we've been stuck in the trilogy story of victim, villain, and hero. 
And again, I think this is sort of where we're looking to break free because we've said, oh gosh, here's an area of my life I don't want to examine. Let there be a hero who comes to fix it so that I won't be hurt by the villain anymore. And But yet at the same point, if if we are a fractal of all of it, and even those who are more noticeable of doing negative things in the world, they're still, and they're still maybe also expressing a part that we were not able to express, you know, or I say to people, if you want your stocks higher and you want your prices lower, there's almost no difference between us and Walmart or, or Amazon or big corporate players that we feel maybe aren't as holistically beneficial. So it's just the whole world of fractal. But when we come back to this and say, my goodness, um, it's, it's really something that, um, gets, gets resolved and saying there's a bad guy or a good guy. And we move beyond it and say, oh, it's actually part of the whole. And we could, um, accept or, or, or see it all and now say, should it be designed on a higher level? Should we view um, what our, our talents and our wealth differently, sort of as this energy that's flowing from us, and money differently? And then do we really come to the dawn of the new abundant world, which I, I think is absolutely accessible for us? Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you see any business models or, let's say, concrete concepts being originated being created this moment? There are, there are actually, you know, it, it is sort of amazing. And um, because I've been talking about this, at least in my own mind, yes. <laughs> you know, or to, to the people around me, I yes. know, often I think, oh, all the people around yeah. me, they had to talk about this, whether they've wanted, you know, wanted to or not. But there's, there's so much in it, you know, and it spokes into the all of life. Um, Yes, you know, already we have, um, there, are, there are companies in California who are beginning to issue their own money backed by what they produce. And um, so, you know, the the world always, um, you know, when money first started, really women in, in, in families, in tribes would divvy up the resources amongst the, the families. And even before people would leave themselves into debt, if they went to repay a debt, they would pay a little bit less or a little bit more. They would never pay the quote unquote right amount because they were always leaving each other in debt to one another because we are connected that way. And we can never really repay each other because it's, we can't have a life without each other. And so there are corporations that are beginning to extend tokens or dollars um, representing a certain amount of their own services. And that's coming. Um, I know of a couple in California who are doing this and they're actually doing this on the blockchain in Brazil. Uh, There are companies who have started to issue dollars backed by soybeans. And of course, we have um, many people doing gold and silver. Um, There are, I I know of several um, smaller towns where the producers in the towns are issuing certificates backed by uh, cement or rubber or farm Um, product. So it really could be all the things that people barter, but it must be monetized. People almost say, always say to me, do you mean that we're going to go back to a barter system? (laughs) You know, or especially when I talked about this free crypto, I talked about it in 2007. Bitcoin had not arrived yet. And I would say, no, no, no. We barter all the time already. When I go to the store to get a coffee, I'm saying, huh, is it worth a certain amount of my investment counseling? you know, um, work thing. And, and, and the, the dollar itself helps us measure that. And then it acts as a receipt and a store of value. It's just that when we create the dollar from someone's mortgage debt, it, it doesn't function properly as, as the prototype of a money because money must be issued as a credit of, of productivity, not as a debt of consumption. And, that gets explained much more repeatedly, re- repetitively in the book to sort of unwind our thinking. But um, when when we and and again, you can feel that spiritual truth because the dollar is my promise to deliver my gifts, not the debt I have to settle. 
you know? And so it really becomes the credit that we're all giving to one another. And, um, there, I, I really do see farmers, um, beginning to issue in parallel communities. Um, and, you know, as any time we have an expansion of consciousness, there often is sort of that, whether it's the squeeze or um, the challenging energy that says, do you really mean it? You know, are you really ready for this next level? So we do have some headwinds of some very um, uh, constricting and not so positive forces per se, um, you know, coming up possibly with a central bank digital currency next year. Um, the dollar is sort of losing its dominance on an orchestrated measure in the country. And um, what could happen is that small banks could go away and only the big banks would survive. And then everyone would have to bank with the Federal Reserve and the powers that be could turn off our access to our own money. And there's a lot of evidence that this type of system is the system that's coming, right? And um, so it's this tighter constriction, this opposite of the nature of humanity and life itself. Um, however, I think it is also sort of what's helping us grow. And if we if we get really too scared, whether we're watching the news too much or we're seeing more instability, which can increase this sort of scarcity can actually increase in the short run as we get to the end of scarcity. But to know that even that um, that limited vision that says, oh, no, no, you know, we have to, the powers that be need to track everything we have and turn off our money and limit what we can buy. Um, it's, it's just a lack of imagination and it will also birth more the awakening of freedom and beauty and expansion in more of humanity. And, um, as any inhale or exhale creates the next, that tight constriction will create this renaissance of rebirth of these new pathways of the proper mm. production backed currencies that have just begun. Mm. So it's life supporting itself. Right. Absolutely. And even that, you yeah. know, even, even when we look at sort of some of these things that seem too ridiculous to talk about, like they seem like, why, why would other people want that much control over, over others and these things? But, you know, I do think it's part of the nature of that dance and, um, and, and, we're, and for us to get beyond the trilogy of hero, uh, vi victim, you know, villain, that kind of a thing. And to birth that self-responsibility to some degree, that constriction and that um, loss that of freedom that those central bank digital currencies may very well represent births that next level in consciousness of saying, no, humanity is ready to be responsible for itself. And even in doing that, we don't lose the beauty of a spiritual life. In fact, that spiritual life even becomes more infused in the material. That's the vision, isn't it? Uh, that's my vision and so many people that I talk to here. Thank you so much, Kristen, for everything you have to offer in th from that depth of timeless wisdom, as I can hear in your voice and through the transmission of your message. Thank you. It's really what we need to hear. All of us are really reminded of. And going back to the dance of seeing what's happening with the perceived reality of some human beings that they have not yet come to this understanding that everything is connected, that life supports itself and it trusts is a huge piece of it. It's really, for me, it has been the practice of seeing as ignorance, yeah. not knowing the truth, which has been my case for so long and how much suffering I went through because of it. I mean, this complex body-mind complex went through. And then seeing that when I see other human beings around me going through suffering, and that's what I, I see that they don't know yet, which is the, the opposite of knowledge is ignorance. So they yet don't know the truth, and I'm in touch with that. So I see more like that. I do call it the dance because it has to be uh, something to move with, not to reject or not to try to escape from. And then the compassion arises, though, from that place. That's what I see, too. And then and I see in this body-mind complex the uh, life supporting itself, like being compassionate toward those who suffer. 
for not yet knowing that they are abundant, mm-hmm. that they are actually abundance itself, that they are that limitless, infinite reality. And that's from a very spiritual perspective. I know in philosophy, it sounds very philosophical. Even the things you say, sometimes I'm listening to you like, oh, that's such a wonderful, I mean, you know you're a visionary. <laughs> sounds so like philosophy, but it's not. I mean, it could be, we can call it whatever we want, but it just resonates mm. true the heart. It really does. I think one of the hardest parts in all of this is um, really being able to let other people suffer. You know, uh, you know, it's, yes, it's yes. I, I think, um, you know, there's so much whether it, or even being comfortable in that suffering or experiencing that in ourselves. Um, and this may even be why it's so difficult to watch someone else suffering and and not for as much as we knock on the glass or speak to the wall. Um, it, it is, that is a very um, alone journey in that. And that the more tolerance we have, because I think it is required in this awakening and um, and it is really a dance in trusting that it's part of that is part of the process, um, and yet still like a wave. I mean, it still should not be frozen and sticking around for so long, but but flowing through, um, and that you know who knows exactly what this process of greater learning and ever greater seeing is. But I, I do think you know, and then we all experience the ramifications of the greed that comes from just the belief in not enoughness. And um, so I, I think when we come home to actually see how the system is set up today, that unfortunately the mechanics of the money system are set up to really exemplify the worst parts of ourself. But then when we see it as a unit that the haves and have nots are actually all on the same circle be using an incorrect design of money as mortgage debt, we can begin to have compassion for ourselves and then also have compassion for the other because everyone is right and wrong because they're being used by a system that was created from a lower state of consciousness that still wanted to be rescued, you know, or wanted to say, listen, just fix it for me. So again, I can get on the couch and get my stuff, you know, sort of that, that those, the, my life flashing for me, that em, em, emptiness. Um, yeah. so yeah, right, yeah I, I really, I find that mm-hmm. to be the most challenging part of this too, is that having more and more spaciousness while we all, um, go through, you know, get thrown around a little bit as we come to the greater realization. And then, of course, maybe we become like the laughing Buddha, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. to see wow, yeah. this yes. is really what's waiting yeah. for us. And, <laughs> and you know, that I, you know, I, I, for at that time, I could learn any um, other way. Sometimes I could see it and make a shift. <laughs> yes, right. I love that too. This, um, Knowing that joy, peace, love, it's always here. We can always access it. So it's not something to wait for in the future. That's another, yeah, I love that uh, that idea. <laughs> the, the one thing I would even offer, and this could even be a practice for listeners or, you know, any of us who are running into this material, um, that even when we exam, like if we, if we catch the awareness of where we are, if we happen to be sort of in these lower ideas and stuck in worry and all the rest of it, um, we can actually feel at that moment, um, if we get the awareness, are we believing in all of the lack that, that there isn't enough money or money is outside of us. And then if we could take a breath, and just wait a moment and then shift to all of our gifts and talents or things that make us happy. And then really stand, you know, even lift up the shoulders and get a greater posture with it. And then see in one to three minutes, do we actually feel differently? Have we reconnected to the abundance and what seemed to be a problem may turn to a possibility Mm. and then even a gift. Right. Oh, my God. I mean, what's not to love about everything you're saying, the way you say it? It's just beautiful. Thank you so much, Krista, for your presence in our reality. And before we say goodbye for today, I apologize for the time limitations. And that's what we speak. I mean, that's the limitation, right, with the reality, transaction reality of the human experience, right, that we, as you said, the systems are already there. They were created with that 
let's say, lower vibration. And sometimes I, I hesitate to kind of put, um, let's say, levels to it, you know, because every, I see everything is spiritual. But let's say different <laughs> vibration. But it is, everything is connected and it's happened at once, right? It is. Here. I mean, and I really do think it is a lower vibration because it's 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 just was created from a mindset of, of less vision, but everything can change in an instant. And as soon as just a critical mass of people, it could be 3%, it could be 5%, very few people are required. That's the other beauty. Um, then that begins to become the dominant resonance in humanity. Um, I really encourage people to come visit me at my website, which is theendofscarcity.com or my name, kristenragason.com, which is K-R-I-S-T-E-N-R-A-G-U-S-I-N.com or find me on all social media. Um, the book is everywhere, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, um, many more that I can't remember and can be ordered at local bookstores. But it's it's the, the book will take people through this journey. It'll heal heal the shame and all the weird emotions that can be entrapped with what we think of as money and break open the heart to come back to where we were intended to be so that we'll be prepared at this critical time when we will have the opportunity to dramatically reshape the world and leave the beautiful paradigm for all those generations to come next. Uh, wonderful. What can I say? So I'll have your website and your book, of course, the link to Amazon on your podcast profile. Thank you so much again for your presence, Kristen. Oh, it's so wonderful. If I could talk to you all day. This I is know. Just, thank, you so I know. thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye, Bye for bye. now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Kristen Regison and her work, please visit kristenregison.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org/podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.